Presents series in which we really take another aspect of journalism and public relations and actually look at the notion of science. Ooh, exciting, or not as the case may be, specifically astronomy. And we are absolutely delighted to be able to welcome to LSJ Presents a gentleman who not only is one of the key popularisers of the science of astronomy, he's a reviews, edi a reviews editor for the fabulous Sky at Night magazine. He's actually brought along a whole collection of freebies that you can actually collect at the end, which normally would set you back at least six pounds, so that's wonderful, isn't it? Which is Night Scenes 2013, uh, which obviously deals with the night sky and a whole range of things. Perhaps even more importantly and wondrously from our sort of point of view, he's also the recipient of the Arthur C. Clarke Lifetime Achievement Award for actually popularising science and astronomy and generally spreading the word. So when it comes to perhaps a public relations exercise in terms of how you actually make astronomy popular, how you get that passion going for uh, astronomy and science writing, as well as obviously making sure that it's fun and that is transmitted, as we know, Brian Cox, the late Sir Patrick Moore, a whole range of other folk work within that, we could ask for non-finer. And in fact, Lincolnshire's finest, originally from Birmingham, but now fully based in Lincolnshire, the fantastic Paul Money. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> OK, so, Paul, let's sort of kick off with that initial line, popularisation of science. I think it's fair to say, if we did a round-robin in the um, lecture theatre today and said how many people actually are keen astronomers, do we actually have any keen astronomers here? Great, that's OK, fine. <laughs> how do you take that line of actually sort of putting it into journalistic terms, getting people excited about what you're writing about. Well, I think one of the things is that, uh, you know, it doesn't cost anything simply to look up, you know. And one of the lines I've always used in my talks is, you know, um, we can walk outside and we can face forward and we can look down, but, you know, what does it cost you just to look up there? And it's amazing when you see something simple as like a shooting star or perhaps the moon that's got a bright star right next to it. And I have no end of the public who are generally not interested in astronomy and space, and the first question is, what was that star next to the moon the other night? So, you know, it catches their attention, you know, and often, you know, you'll find out it's a, perhaps a planet or a, a one of the bright stars, such as, you know, Regulus or such. But, you know, it, the fact that all it takes is to look up, you know, and just think, well, what is that up there? You know, uh, because the, there isn't just your normal everyday life sort of thing going along. There's a lot happening in the sky and the universe that you can actually observe, and a lot of it with the naked eye as well. The quality of writing is something that's essential. We were talking before the, the session started today about obviously our love of science fiction and the mm -hmm. line from that. What was it that kind of inspired you to actually get into astronomy? <laughs> well, science fiction. Um, we basically, yes, I, I grew up with Thunderbirds. You know, uh, the the early original series of Star Trek, uh, Lost in Space, and all that, and, and Fireball XL Five sort of thing. Google it. Right. But, uh, you know, it was that sort of thing that actually got me right into astronomy. But uh, that was more space and space flight. And the other thing that I found was actually uh, I actually wanted to be an astronaut. Um, actually, as it happens, I've ended up being an astronaut, but that's another story. But, you know, the thing is, it was those sort of shows and also um, written books. I mean, you had the Lady Bird book. Series. There were, there were several actually dealt with astronomy. I had the Observer's Book of Astronomy, which was, of course, written by Sir Patrick Moore, which was, you know, always with me in my little tiny book that I, I knew what to look out for in the night sky. Just fetch the Observer book out, and there it was, the constellations, etc. Um, but uh, I also remember when I was in, it must have been around about I was seven or eight, and I, it must have been one of the first astronomy books I'd ever seen. I can't remember the title of it now, but it opened up. It was one of those pop up books. You know, our kids, you love the pop-up books, and it was pop-up rockets and satellites, because that was the era of, like, Apollo, sort of the 1960s, and the, there was a lot of interest in space at that time. So programmes reflected it, you know, a lot of the popular books are reflected it as well. They caught on, they got onto the bandwagon. And so reading those things helped to inspire me, seeing the programmes and imagining myself in space, you know, helped to inspire me as well. When we're talking about popularising science, we, we, we start with the science writing, we write our main journalism, it was in, in, in science journalism from that point of view. Mm -hmm. 
Is it something that you think there is an improvement here? I mean, clearly the university is committed to a science park, you know, we're very much committed to, to that whole notion. Or is it still a case that people are frightened of science? Or they still get confused between astrology and astronomy? <laughs> and all of those things that go together. I think it's a good combination of a lot, actually. Um, certainly, um, I think science does seem to frighten a lot of people. And I think that's so sad because science gives you... I mean, come on, we, we've all got things like that, you know. Well, it was science that gave you that that you often play around, and may, you may only use it for texting or going on Facebook and updating your statuses, etc. But the point is, it's science that gave, that led to the development of this. The camera that's recorded in here, the lights even, it is all down to science. You don't have to believe in science for science to actually work, because it works all around you every split second. And I find that fascinating, that, you know, whatever we've got around us, you know, we can use science to actually explain it, to understand it. And, uh, you know, going back to the science fiction series, that was the point of science fiction, was that it was trying to look at the future and using science to debrief what the future was going to be. So I do think there is a lot of, sort of like, public sort of frightened of science, thinking it's technical, but in actual fact, science operates on a whole range of levels. You know, you don't have to know, you know, I'm, I'm not a great mathematician sort of thing, you know, I can make two plus two, it's clearly five, but, uh, you know, you, I am not a mathematician, but I can still appreciate the workings of the universe. I can appreciate the planets moving against the background stars and that it's gravity doing that. I don't have to necessarily understand Einstein's equations to understand that. I can appreciate how it actually works on a general level. And it's whether you then want to take that onto a deeper level, and actually, and the journalism comes into it because you know the journalism I think has actually improved and made it more accessible um, because we've now got you know in the UK especially we've got two major astronomy magazines we've got Astronomy Now which actually started first and was started by Patrick Moore, and now of course we've got the Sky at Night magazine, and hopefully. They're trying to make it more popular, and you read it, and you think, well, actually, I understand this. You know, they're often at a level, I think, now that it's actually so that anybody can understand science. Um, hashtag yeah. LSJ, by the way, as the <laughs> code, if you're actually tweeting various other things, hashtag LSJ. Let's remind people of that. Um, events like Lincoln Inspired, oh, yeah. which obviously a key part yeah. of your science patron for Lincoln yeah. Inspired. Um, can also kind of help encourage people to get a flavour of, of what the yeah. whole thing is about. Um, Again, we're in the early part of the 21st century. We've come through a whole range of scientific sort of things, etc. Do you, from your vantage point now, sometimes think as though you are preaching to the converted, or is it a case of, you know, we still got to start from scratch here? I still think there's a lot of work to do because, as I say, the, the, the public are still, they, they love having all the scientific gadgets, but, you know, they still don't seem to quite grasp that science gives us everything. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think the future is bright. I won't say it's orange, no, no. Um, but, uh, you know, but it is bright. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, a great deal to be done still in promoting science, and, uh, and places like Lincoln are actually are doing a great job on doing that. You've come to the science writing not as a trained journalist, but as somebody who's obviously led to that. Mm -hmm. When you got the call from the Sky at Night magazine to say, do you fancy being our reviews editor? <laughs> what was the response? Are you sort of like, yeah. Shock. <laughs> um, I, I, I sort of had done writing though before and because uh, I actually wrote for Astronomy Now I got approached because I do a lot of public lectures I mean I'm averaging about 100 a year uh, all over the country to astronomical societies and basically any group will have me you know who can put up with me um, you know Hence here. <laughs> but the thing was, I'd got a, a bit of a reputation of being able to you know, sort of put over astronomy and try to make it fun. And uh, Astronomy Now actually originally asked me to write some articles, and I did a series of articles for them. Uh, ironically, I had a, a, an up-and-coming uh, science journalist who was just finishing his degree course in science journalism send me a load of articles, and I was quite amazed. I thought, this is really good, you know. So I sent, <laughs> I sent the articles down to Astronomy Now, and the next thing I know, I'm not getting any article requests from Astronomy Now. They're going to this chat. <laughs> ironically, he's now their editor. <laughs> so, and I went to a convention around about three years ago that the Astronomy Now actually run called Astrofest, always based in London. And uh, the ironic thing was, I, I snuck in as the reviews editor of the rival magazine. I thought, sneak in. And I, I got in and I got chatting to people. And then, of all people, he walked up to me and I thought, this is it, I'm going to get booted out, you know. And he shook me hand. He said, if you want for you, I won't be here. It says, so, you know, you got me, in the end, the editorship of Astronomy Now by introducing my articles because you like my articles so much. 
The ironic thing was, I was then, because I wasn't allowed to, you would have gone blank, you see, sort of thing. At least I don't go blank. You'll have a job <laughs> shortly up now you've started me. But the thing was, um, I sort of, I also had a bad experience with a magazine that I'm glad to say doesn't now exist because it got to the stage where the writers, actually there was a whole series of us didn't get paid. And that gave me a bit of a, you know, you sort of backed off from the idea you of writing. You can do so much for your children. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so... I was a bit surprised when I got the call from Graham Sullivan, who was the editor of Sky at Night magazine. And the magazine had been going about a year, so it was still tentative. I mean, he was on, you know, he was finding the ground, really, and seeing, you know, is there really a, a mass audience for it? Will the, the name Sky at Night carry it forward? But Patrick was heavily involved now, because he dropped out from astronomy now. He'd actually had a bit of a falling out with them. Um, so he was actually, he got that going and he was really pleased that it was connected with Sky at Night. So Graham contacted me and he said, well, I've read one of your articles that you did some years ago for Astronomy Now. I'd like you to do a similar one for us. And, what? <laughs> the Sky at Night? The Sky at Night? They want me to write for them? I'm not a writer, really. You know, I, I learned that we're doing Astronomy Now. I didn't think I did a particularly good job, but then people did say they liked what I wrote. Um, so... I wrote the article for him, and uh, they enjoyed it. A couple of months went by, and then I got a call from the deputy <coughs> editor saying, we've got some equipment that we'd like you to review. Would you consider doing that? Well, all right, then, you know, do I get paid? Yes, that's a plus for a start. So, uh, so I accepted that. I wrote the article, I, I did the review, and the ironic thing was they hadn't done what we would call a level playing field with the equipment reviews. They'd actually sent me different packages instead of sort of making sure they were all virtually identical with the packages. So I reviewed the equipment, and because I didn't know otherwise, I scored them accordingly. And one telescope literally was the bare bones, this is all you get. And it was very, I mean, we were talking two to three grand per telescope, and I had four of them to play with. And one of them was just a tube. You had to add everything else to it as such. The others were variations of packages where at least you had an eyepiece. You know, you had a, what we call a star a finder as well. So I scored them highly. What I didn't know was the other telescope could have come as a package as well. And the person who had organised it in the office didn't know that. Had the equipment sent to me, I scored accordingly. Of course, it caused a bit of an ooh -ah. And then when they said to me, well, why did you score it like this? I said, well, this is because you actually sent me... This is the equipment you sent me. You told me to review it. I reviewed as I found what you should have done was either make them all simple OTAs, optical tubes, or all packages. You seem to know what you're talking about. I thought, that's a first. Yeah, but, you know, basically, I had, they realised that I knew what I was talking about and that I recognised where the faults were. So, about a week later, I got a call saying, would I like to organise the... They didn't call me reviews editor. They said, would you like to organise the reviews? Fine, OK. And then they said, uh, you'll have to move to Bristol. No. That's a step too far. That's a step too far. Really. I, I may have been born in Birmingham, but I was only there the first three months of my life. Um, but I consider myself a Lincolnshire person. You know, I, you know, I know you're supposed to be Yellow Valley if you're born here. Look, I was only born in Birmingham. Three months, the rest of my life, I've been in Lincolnshire. I've never known anything else. So I, as far as I'm concerned, I'm a Yellow Belly, really. But... I, the idea of moving to Bristol, no, I love my county. It's going to take a lot for me to actually move out of here. So I said no. And then two weeks later, they came back and said, we've been thinking about this. He said, actually, your job, all you have to do is actually do it on the phone and email. I said, it's the internet nowadays. I mean, all you're doing is contacting suppliers, you know, checking on the web of what they're actually selling and then arranging for it to be delivered. Can you do that? Yeah, all right. Then he said, by the way, we'll call you the reviews editor. I said, oh, I'm an editor. I said, I haven't got any journalistic training. Don't worry about that. You're organising it, but we want you to write some of the reviews and usually we'll have a little piece to write about at the beginning of the review section sort of thing. So my mugshot will be there and, you know, to bore people completely, put them off more like, and just to introduce the actual reviews themselves. And that was in 2006. My first section was actually in the September issue and uh, I still can't believe I'm still there. They haven't got rid of me yet. And, and does it sort of cross over in terms of consumer journalism? I mean, obviously, magazines have a long history of if it gets a four-star rating, more people will buy it. Is, is there a kind of connection within that? Do you finally get feedback, people saying they, you know, they, they trust your... Yes, they do. And, and I think the thing is, with having the name Sky at Night as well, um, they trusted Patrick 
so therefore they trusted the magazine and the reviews do garner a lot of trust um, in doing them so uh, we have to be and I have to be very careful when I'm choosing the reviewer so uh, one of the guiding principles I have is I try to make sure you choose the right person for the right job because you know may say reviewing telescopes but there are different types of telescopes so there are different nuances to each different telescope that you've got to test and make sure you test thoroughly. You've got different mounts that you've got to test. So you've got to have people who actually know something about the different types of systems. And then there's imaging cameras. You know, you've got the SLRs, you've got sort of like high quality CCD cameras, you know, webcams nowadays, you know, astronomers use webcams to create some incredible pictures of the planets. You know, some of the pictures in Sky at Night of the planets are taken with basically just a slightly modified webcam. You know, so uh, it is amazing what you can do, and they're producing pictures actually that make some of the professionals 30 years ago look sick. You know, you look at the pictures and think, good grief! You know, you think a spacecraft had taken some of the pictures now. So you know, we have to be careful, and I have to be careful. But I, I've built up a, a sort of like a, a knowledge of the different reviewers. I've got to know them well. I know what they're capable of. Who's best for what a piece of equipment? And so, you know, I mean, it'd be great, wouldn't it? On the reviews, in theory, I could own all of them, you know. But I know I'm not good enough to do all of them. I, I have my little niche, you know. I like particularly refractors and imaging wide field with refractors. And I can do a little bit with some mounts and such. But I know I can't do a CCD camera. I'm not technical enough. I can't get the best out of that CCD. But I know somebody who can, you know. And so you've got, to, you've got to use that, yeah. That's the pattern we want, so you can start off with a pair of binoculars. Yes, Just yeah. Like from there. What about the gender split in terms of astronomy? I mean, we, 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 many, I mean obviously Heather Cooper is one of notable examples of that, and, and we've had, obviously, uh, Brian May, um, Brian Cox, Cox, of course, yeah. you know, both sort of coming yeah. from the rock and roll sort of line, <laughs> yes. to the whole thing, Dara yeah. and Brian as well. Mm -hmm. Is there still a sort of gender bias in terms of there is, and, and I think it's sad actually because uh, I, I mean I, I meet uh, a lot of women in astronomy, um, and, I, and as a lot of them are actually very very capable at writing. Uh, I'm pleased to say that actually on the editorial team, uh, one of our uh, previous writers, Will Gator, has left. He's gone freelance, uh, and we've now got Izzy, as she likes to be called, Elizabeth. She's joined the team, and she beat off all the you know, the blokes. The, she was the best of the bunch and that's what's important. I do believe it really should be down to your qualification. I don't care what gender you are, you know, you could be a green eyed bump monster from Mars, but if you really? did oh, yeah, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but if but if you do the job right, then you know, and you know your stuff, then you should be able to do that job. So I, I completely, you know, I'm, I'm one of those that I do believe in trying to encourage anybody to do astronomy in space. Um, and one little story actually on that and is that I've, I've been fortunate and over the years have been doing astronomy talks and uh, generally trying to make it fun. I mean, astronomy, I mean, if you don't like it, go and do something else. Fly fishing or something like that. You know, you, you all have your own little things that you particularly like doing. Well, you know, try to make a career out of it if you can. But, you know, I do say to people, you know, if you don't like it, do something else. But if you really like it, be enthusiastic. You know, get stuck in, you know, and show people you're enthusiastic. Well, I, I think you can tell I'm quite boring, actually, in my subject. Um, but, uh, but you should be. And I was very pleased in that uh, many years ago I came across a, a, a nine-year-old boy who uh, I was told was a bit of a, an unruly, unruly little devil. Uh, he, I got him to join our local astronomy club. I was the chairman. and In fact, the social services in the south of the county had actually contacted me and said, look, we can't make any sense of him. We don't know whether he's telling us a load of rubbish when he talks astronomy or whether in actual fact he actually knows his stuff. So I took him under my wing and he, he did know his stuff. He was really keen. He is now the UK's foremost planetary imager. And if you go on his website, it's called Damien Peach. You go on the website and you actually find that he's got two people listed as inspiring, Patrick Moore and the other PM. And I'm not talking about a prime minister either. Um, following on from that, uh, there was a, a young lady. I gave a talk at Bedford Astronomical Society some years ago. And it is many years ago. And, uh, and I, I can vaguely remember this little girl and her father coming up to me and saying she wanted to do astronomy. And I said, well, study hard, go to university, you know, you've got to work at this, but, you know, there's no reason why you can't. She's now an astrophysicist, you know, jo Dr. Joanna Jarvis. And I accidentally bumped into her. I, I hadn't seen her near enough since that time. I only saw her a couple of times of the day. And uh, then about two years ago, I went to talk at a, a society down over at um, Rugby, 
and she was actually uh, one of the organisers of it, and she came up to me, she may not remember me, but she, she's, you know, she's up here now, you know, massive ginger hair, so quite affinity with me. In fact, she calls me dad too now. Um, but, you know, she said, um, I was that little girl. Um, I've done an astrophysics degree. Actually, she's now gone freelance into astronomy lecturing like I do, and organising courses. So I was really pleased that, a, you know, a, a girl had taken on that, that on board and she's now a NASA physicist. And in terms of obviously that Arthur C. Clarke award we mentioned, I mean, very much the, the, one of the, the, the founding fathers of modern day science fiction mm. and, and writing and popularising science as well. I mean, when you first got the notion that you were going to receive that Lifetime Achievement Award, what was the feeling? I, I had no idea. That was a bolt out of the blue. Um, you know, and again, that was another young lad who I'd actually in, uh, inspired or helped to inspire um, over at Skegness Grammar School mm. and he'd come along to some of my public star nights and got hooked and he joined our club as well and, uh, and I, I sort of encouraged him suggested which sort of universities might favour the subject matter he was interested in and, uh, and in fact he represented uh, the UK um, two year, uh, three years ago um, when they did a, a big science thing at the UN and he represented the UK for that um, but he put me forward for this award um, because it was to, sort of, as you say, honour people who have publicised and promoted astronomy in space. I've been doing it for 30 years. Clearly, I started when I was two. But uh, I've got to try, haven't I, sort of thing, you know. That. But the thing was, that was a bolt out of the blue. I had no idea. Now, I had had a hint some years before I had the Eric Zucker Award uh, from the Federation of Astronomical Societies, and I'd sort of had a hint that this was on the way. So this Arthur C. Clarke, and the Arthur C. Clarke, you know, they actually, they, they won't call it the Arthur C. Clarke because the Arthur C. Clarke is science fiction. And it's the awards for science fiction writing. So, uh, so he uh, uh, accepted, the, you know, he was approached by the British Rocketry Group and said, we want to set up these awards for promoting this sort of thing. So he said, well, don't do Arthur C. Clarke. He says, use Sir Arthur Clarke Awards. And um, I actually got the email and I thought it was spam. <laughs> so you have, you know, the, deletion, well, man. yeah, it nearly was because it came, it actually came up, sort of thing. You have been awarded, yeah. and you know how you get them. And I was waiting send for you to say Nigeria, <laughs> you know, send your details off. And I nearly deleted it, and then I saw who had authored it. It was a member of the, it was actually the secretary of the British Interplanetary Society. I thought, well, that's funny, sort of thing. Why is she doing that? She wouldn't be. She must be serious. So I, I knew the contact of one of the people who set up the the actual organisation, the British Rocketry Group. Um, and I thought, well, I know uh, who does that. I'll phone them. So I phoned them and said, I've had this email, <laughs> you know. Um, what's it about? Is it true? He said, yes. But he said, but you're in the top three. You're in the final three. So, you know, you'll have to come along to the House of Lords and find out whether it's actually going to be you or not. And then he gave me the date and they said, well, I can't. And he said, what do you mean? So you've gone to the House of Lords. I said, I can't because I have a public astronomy event over priorities. at Gibraltar Point, and I said, my priority is public. The whole point is, you know, it's all right swanning off and collecting, you know, and I don't even know that I'm going to get it. He said, but the point is, you know, I've got probably 30 or 40 people coming along to my star night. I'm not going to let them down. So I didn't hear any more about it. They, they sent the email saying, we're well, sorry to hear that you're not going to be able to come along, um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, can you nominate somebody in case in front of it was young Ryan from Skegness? Sort of thing I nominated him because he was going to be at the awards yeah. and he texted me just I thought hang on the, the awards are just about to start and he went, you've won I'm going the awards have only they haven't even started yet it's literally five minutes before the awards start and apparently the organiser who hands out all the prizes and whatnot come to him quietly and said Paul's won <laughs> be prepared you're going to be the one called up because he was quite nervous. They didn't have a video link set up for you to actually no, do a pre-recorded no, thing. No, 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 <laughs> no. But, but, you know, but, uh, but it, it was a pop out of the blue, because I just thought to myself, they had two top professors who also do promotion of astronomy and space, and they had these two top professors, and I, I, well, I just thought, well, I'm not in their league, you know, they'll get it, you know, be, be between them two. And I, I just carried on, went to Gibraltar Point, and literally, because I'd heard that day, I, I announced the Gibraltar Point group, said, I, 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 I've got this award. <laughs> You know, I've done, I've, I've done, I don't know why. <laughs> and they said, we know why, because you're a nutter. You know, that's... The moral of the story is never delete your emails before yes. you've actually read them through. Any general questions people have actually got that to sort of come up with at this stage? Any... Don't be shy. <laughs> be warned. If you ask a short question, you might get an hour-long talk. <laughs> I will try to keep it quiet. Of course. But, yeah. Yeah.
Would you go to space if you had... Oh, chance? would I go? Would I go? Now, what a question. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, my, my wife has sometimes said sort of thing, you know, when are you going up there? <laughs> but, uh, no, I, yes, I would. Um, and in fact, when Challenger blew up back in 1986... Um, one of the things I said straight after it was that, you know, I, I would still go up because space is dangerous. You know, I always, I'm always i always amazed at the astronauts when they actually went into the shuttle because basically you've got this spacecraft and you've got two blooming great fireworks stuck to the side of it. That's effectively what the actual solid rocket boosters were. Hydrogen and oxygen. You know. uh, well, hydrogen and oxygen, that was the liquid. They could at least control yeah. that. But the, the, once they lit the two SRBs, that was it. You are going. You know, um, you know, they, 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 there was no choice because they couldn't turn them off. Now the liquid engines, the main shuttle engines, they could actually be throttled down. They could actually be switched off. So you know, so that was one of the abort to orbits or abort to landings that they could actually do. But the SRBs, once you, they were giant fireworks. Once you lit them, you were going. Um, but so I, I had a, a great deal of. I just thought they were amazing, the astronauts that uh, went up into space on the shuttle. But straight away after it, they said, you know, it's dangerous. We, you know, if you're an astronaut, you accept that. They, it's all written into their contract, and they say, yeah, I'm going to sign here because I know it's dangerous. I know <laughs> climbing to a rocket with lots and lots of fuel and two big fireworks, I might die. <laughs> and I might die. And they, you know, and they accept it. Um, and I would do it, you know. And even after Columbia. Uh, 2003, if I remember right. Very tragic that. Um, but you know, I would I would go into space now uh, if I given a chance. I have actually got lots of friends who would like me to go into space, <laughs> and I suspect just one way, you know. So uh, you know, but uh, I've yet to see that film Gravity. Sort of, I've, I've heard a lot about this film Gravity sort of thing. So uh, you know, my worry about that film is the fact that they're still using the shuttle, and the shuttle's been retired two years. You know, come on, filmmakers, they could have come up with someone else, come on, instead of using a shuttle, which has been retired. You know, it does make you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah. Debbie. Hi. Um, obviously, the, the kinds of publications you're writing for tend to be, in the main, the ones you've been talking about anyway so far, uh, are for a, a, a target audience that already has some prior knowledge of the subject area, so you can already assume some prior knowledge. What's your take, then, on... Um, journalism in the mainstream from general press and how they report issues <laughs> within it, your subject. It's, it's a really good question because it, it drives me mad. Um, I think um, when you're dealing with, say, Astronomy Now or Sky at Night magazine, because we're already into the subject, you know, we, we do treat it with, the, I hope, the respect it deserves. And I hope we don't sensationalise things. When you get into the mainstream media, it's the exact opposite. Um, you tend to find sort of thing that they need an angle, they need to make it you know, particularly extreme often to get people to read the actual article. So you'll see like, headlines like, you know, Earth to be destroyed by asteroid, you know, tomorrow, you know, <laughs> when it's probably about 50 years away. Um, you know, and that's just recently happened. The, the Ukrainians, I think it is, have just discovered an asteroid that may, may hit us in 2032. The good news is, um, what's happened is they've picked up on the fact that you know, NASA have this <coughs> list of potentially hazardous objects. And when they make a new discovery, they only have a few observations. So we haven't got a very accurate orbit. So what happens was, when they looked at the preliminary orbit, part of the path of that potentially could impact the Earth. So what happens, it goes to the top of the, these are the ones we need to look out for. The trouble is, the media then look at that, go, it's going to hit us! It isn't a case of this is, you know, there's a big error margin into the orbit. And that, you know, and what happens is once you've got enough observations, you find every single one so far. Is that water? <laughs> That's it. Well, apart so, from yeah, Tungushka, of course. Tungushka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But the thing is, we didn't know about that until no, it happened. Yeah, exactly. Whereas at the moment, we're at the stage where we can actually discover these things. So you need a lot of observations to refine the orbit, so that you then can rule out whether there's going to be an impact or not. So this one is so fresh, there isn't enough observations, and I'm pretty sure that they will get enough observations that they'll say, basically, it will drop off that list and it'll end up being a non-event. And they all end up like that. But... As soon as it goes to the top of the list and gets flagged up as a potential might somewhere come close hit, you know, they don't know which, it suddenly gets, 
asteroid will devastate the earth. You've got like, yeah, what was it, 32, 2032? Oh gosh, we ain't got long. You know, and that worries me because, you know, I, I look at it and as soon as I saw the headline, as soon as I saw it, because I saw it on Facebook, fun enough, the first thing I saw, I thought, right, I bet they've got around about 20 or 30 observations. You need about 500 or more to really refine an orbit down so that you can know far enough in the future where it's going to be. Um, so I knew the number of observations they got weren't far enough, anywhere near enough to rule it out. And you tend to find this sort of thing. And it, it, it worries me, but there's, on the media side, you get sort of like the TV media and you get the newspapers. It seems to be more sensationalism and they're not written by... I can't, really can't say proper scientist, but, you know, scientifically trained journalists. And that worries me. Whereas at least with sort of the magazines, you know, Sky at Night and the you know, American Sky and Telescope, that was the first magazine I ever got and still subscribe to, um, they tend to approach it practically and say, look, you know, this is a potential, but we know they'll refine the orbit and it probably will miss us completely. But don't quote us totally on that. Because you know, we don't know. There are, there are error margins in these things. In so it does worry me, Debbie. It does worry me about the, the way how it's sensationalised sometimes. You know. In terms of, though, just following on from that, obviously we have a multi-platform multimedia age that's actually around. Yeah. Do you find that's one of the kind of breeding grounds for things like the statement that actually the Apollo landings never took place? Oh. The conspiracy <laughs> theorists? <laughs> the areas in there? Um, it is very easy for anybody now to basically, you know, grab a picture, modify it, and then put it up as if it's their own work, or this has come from NASA, it shows an alien floating in space and whatnot, when, when you look at the original raw NASA picture, there was absolutely nothing there. Um, and I think, actually, modern media allows that to happen far more frequently. It's too easy, you can do it on Facebook or any of the you know, social media, you can do that. Um, and I, I, people do tend to sort of grab pictures, and re regardless of copyright, that's the other worrying thing, of course, sort of in copyright issues. Um, that you know, they'll grab it and they'll post them up as if it's their own. And, uh, well, we can have access to the Hubble Telescope. Well, it's, oh, it's amazing, yeah, sort of thing. You know, this is the latest <laughs> picture I took, and you're looking at it, thought, yes, Hubble receipts, that, you know, sort of like, or, or Chandra or whichever. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, and that, that is worrying. And, and um, again, you know, how many times do you have to say, I mean, they, I remember the conspiracy theorists saying some years ago that, you know, well, we'll finally believe you when they photograph the actual landing sites from lunar orbit. Now we've got Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter photograph the landing sites. There's actually the trails of the astronauts scuffing the dust up where they walked around. And what are they saying? Oh, it's still fake! You know? Oh, NASA are hiding something. They've gone and doctored the photographs. I think, hang on, a few years ago you were saying that if you saw that picture you'd believe us. Now we're saying, you've moved it. Talk about badges moving goalposts. They seem to move the goalposts a lot as well. So, um, you know, I have this theory that in actual fact, what we should do is, clear, and I do apologise if you are a conspiracy theorist. Any in the, any, you any, know, But if you, if you didn't believe they went, um, this is what I would do. I'd actually put all the non-believers of the Apollo uh, missions, and I'd put them in a massive great rocket. We'd fly out to the moon, we'd land right next to one of the landing sites, hopefully with one with the flag up, because we, we do know it. Apollo 11, the flag has fallen over. All the other flags are still standing. But we'd land right next to it, and I'd say, now, the best view is actually out of the porthole in the airlock. So we'll all go down to the airlock, and we're looking out the porthole, and then I'll press the button for the door to open, and in their final dying moments, as they fall out right in front of the descent stage, their last gasp will be, they did go! <laughs> Gone. This is a site you're obviously aware of. I know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm obviously not really passionate about that. <laughs> well, but it worries me when people, you know, it, it, I mean, how many times do you have to bang your head and say, look, there are tens of thousands of images the Apollo astronauts took that are all cross -red. Oh, yeah, well, we only ever see the really good ones. That's what, well, would you show every single picture? In, mind you, nowadays people do, don't they? They tend to put it on Facebook. They don't think of editing it and picking up the best pictures. You get the entire holiday, don't you? You get the whole thing from start plane ride at the start to the plane ride at the end, even landing and showing the runway, you know. But whereas when I put things up like that, I actually put up, you know, the highlights, like this is whatever I saw, it was interesting, this is a geological formation, or uh, this is a nice clip. I like geology, you see, as well. Astronomers tend to have very similar interests. You know?
planetary geology, things like that sort of thing, you know. But uh, you know, but uh, you know, but it, it is interesting. I find sort of thing. It's um, you know, I've lost my track. No, I've got no, so no, excited. No. I've lost my track. What, so, even so what you do with conspiracy theory stuff? Oh yes, that, that, was, that, that was part of it. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I'd like to ask, with all that knowledge that you have, do you get? I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that you get filmmakers come up to you just to query issues or somebody must do their research before they make a scientific film in um, uh, Are you talking about movies or yeah. a scientific programme sort of thing like Brian Cox etc? Or movies? Know. Or movies. Um, well movies, I mean obviously they don't approach me, I'm, 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 I'm down here, oh. you know, sort of on the scale of things. You know. Not sure if you've done uh, a nice uh, <laughs> Hopefully not. But uh, um, movies, they do actually approach, you know, officials from NASA. Um, and they get their advice on how things... And I think this is why this, the latest film, this Gravity film, has got quite a few plaudits, because they really have paid attention to how somebody would be floating in space, and, you know, there's still a few... But you've got to understand there will always be artistic licence. You've got to... For a storytelling purpose, sometimes <coughs> you can't stick with reality. You have to twist it a little bit to get the story. You know, I mean, my favourite bad example of that is Armageddon, Bruce Willis and the space, oh, the modified space shuttle, you know, sort of landing and planting a blooming great big bomb on this comet <coughs> sort of thing, you know. And there was so much wrong with that movie, you know, that I could have, you know, pulled, you know, I was pulling my air out sort of thing. I didn't enjoy the movie because it was just so wrong. There was just too much wrong in terms of science. And I think it may have been that one whereby NASA had been consulted and NASA backtracked and said, don't <coughs> even put a name to it, you know. So uh, they do, they are approached. And um, if you've got, like, somebody like Ron Howard has a really good eye with Apollo 13 and he, he paid attention to what the astronauts physically told him about what it was like being on Apollo 13 and, and on the Apollo missions. And he really worked that in, I thought, extremely well. Um, but, uh, you know, but, you know, sometimes for a good story, sometimes you do have to suspend dis disbelief, you know, suspend disbelief. So the point is, you know, um, they may approach NASA and people like that and get ideas of what it should be like. But if it doesn't quite make the story exciting, then they, it's, it's fiction. And so, therefore, you, know, you often find little rules will get broken in order to move the story on. Um, I do think that if actually we, we did everything scientifically accurate, most science fiction films would probably be boring, to be quite honest, because you've got, you've got to have a bit of excitement. But uh, there are some series, I mean, you know, one of the things I noticed was that I'm, I'm a great fan of Babylon 5. I like Star Trek, don't get me wrong, but I like Babylon 5. And one of the things that came out from that was that they talked to NASA, and there was the thing called the Star Furies, and the way how they reacted and turned around and used thrusters that's got plaudits for the accuracy or what they think, yeah, that's how it would happen in zero G in space. Whereas, you know, often you have sort of spacecraft doing things that really would tear them apart in a lot of science fiction and such. And we discussed about Independence Day and plugging a blooming Windows export, whatever it was sort of thing, and you know, uploading a virus to an advanced spacecraft who just happened to have a USB port. <laughs> Bizarre. It might have been Will Smith, but even it so, was Will Smith. Yeah. <laughs> Step too far. So, Paul, um, views of scientists and media tend to often be stereotyped. They sort of work from the eccentric to the yeah. bizarre to the, sort of, to the classic mad scientist line. Obviously, Sir Patrick, to a certain extent, played up to that yeah. to a point and worked with that. Is that helpful or, or a hindrance when you're actually dealing with the sort of public image of science and so on? Would you say no? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I think, really, you've got to have a certain eccentricity about you. I mean, you know, obviously I'm one of the quieter versions. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but the point is, you know, I, I hope that brings... I, th I think, you know, you've got to have the Patrick Malls. Um, I, I, I would say I, I like Brian Cox, but I sometimes find him a little dull. bit... Not dull, oh. what? <laughs> cruel. Yeah, perhaps. But uh, we're looking up into the sky now and it's really wonderful. <laughs> no, if I did that, I'd say, God, come on, everybody, look up at the sky. Look at the billions of stars. And yeah, that's how you do it. You know, so, you know, I, I've, I've lost my call. Oh, sort of yeah. thing, you know. But, uh, you know, but I do think, you know, that I'm, I'm hoping that the stereotypical view of the mad scientist is gradually being lost. But I think what we should have is uh, the scientists that are enthusiastic, you know. Scientists are um, heroes. Um, we'll never be that. 
especially the movies. Well, never mind you, it depends on who plays us as well, sort of thing, you know. But uh, you know, but uh, yeah, I'd like to see more scientists portrayed as heroes and heroines, as you quite rightly say as well. But uh, if it makes, if it doesn't make for a good story, then you know that, that, that that's the first thing that gets sidetracked into, it, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, but yes, uh, I'd like to see them a bit more you know, in the mainstream popular that we aren't the nutters. Okay, some of us are, but you know, but we aren't nutters, sort of thing. And we are the ones that give you everything else. I mean, I, I, I can't claim for that because I'm a popularizer. Mm. As I tend to see my role as a popularizer of astronomy and trying to get people to look up, and then hopefully you might be inspired to go into it deeper or find another aspect, sort of thing, perhaps go into. You know, sort of the robotic astronomy or robotic telescopes. You know, I mean, robotics is an amazing thing. Look how much that has come from, come on, and it's amazing what you can do in space with robotics. Um, but I am a great believer also in humans going out. We have that quality. We have, we can have that leap, can't we? We can make sort of like three and four add up together, and it can be completely different. It doesn't have to be. Yeah, we know. And I, one of the things I often quote when it comes to human spaceflight, because I actually got into an argument with the Astronomer Royal some years ago by accident. Um, just... Not quite, no. I, he was, actually, I was in the audience and there was a panel of scientists. It was down at Cambridge. And uh, I'd gone down for this. So I got invited by a friend who was a teacher. Um, because I sort of did courses on astronomy, even though I'm not qualified as a teacher in that respect. Um, we had this big panel. There was top scientists. Um, there were, you know, and there was the Astronomer Royal, Sir Martin Rees. I can't remember the Scottish Astronomer Royal, but he was the one that backed me, of all things. And he basically he said, uh, well, of course, you know, human spaceflight is a waste of money, waste of time, you know, why should we should do that or anything like that? And, and I sort of, <coughs> like, ah, ah, yeah, yeah. The trouble is, they'd been giving us wine. <laughs> I think that's where the Dutch courage came from. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, just, just hold on a bit. You are the Astronomer Royal. And you're using data from the Hubble Space Telescope, which wouldn't give you the data if humans hadn't flown up on the shuttle and repaired it. And the Scottish astronomer all picked, that's a very good point. Yes, yes, you're all going on about human space and not wanting it, and yet you wouldn't be able to do half your job if they hadn't gone up there and repaired the HST. And the other thing I threw in at the same time was that, uh, and another thing, this is the wine talking, yeah. and another thing, you know, the Galileo spacecraft that's flying at, that was the time when Galileo was flying to Jupiter, and they'd actually designed the antenna, the high gain antenna, they designed it as an umbrella. And the idea was that, you know, because Galileo didn't have enough energy to go all the way out to Jupiter in one go, they had to do what they called gravity assist, so they had to throw it into the inner solar system, bring it back to the Earth, so as it went past, it got a bit of a, an energy boost. It then went round, flew past Venus and got an energy boost. And I think it did another final flyby of the Earth again. So that was how they could speed it up. So it would have enough speed to get out to Jupiter. Well, the trouble is, when they sent it into the inner solar system, the umbrella was all right. That was to protect the antenna so it didn't get damaged from the extreme radiation from the sun. But as it started flying out and headed out and they went to unfurl it, three of the prongs stuck as they do sometimes with umbrellas, so it didn't unfurl. So instead of having a data rate transmitting at Jupiter back to the Earth of like thousands of bits of data per second, they had 100. In other words, it, they couldn't take lots and lots of pictures on the go and then transmit them straight back to the Earth. They could take five or six per day instead of hundreds. So, uh, so they're constrained. And I said, now if that had been a human mission, you could have had a 2001 moment. You could have sent Dave Bowman out. He could have drifted along, got the antenna, ah, opened it up, gone back inside, mission solved, success. But it was a robotic mission. There was no way they could do anything about that antenna. And that got them talking as well. So after that, I suddenly started sobering up, I think, and realising, oops, I kept quiet. Would anybody here like to be a space tourist or sort of take up the opportunity of space? So, yes. Yeah. One. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you're braver than that, you lot. <laughs> Exploring those frontiers and so on. Any other sort of comments? Yes. Um, just to pick you up on um, journalists and, and writing about science, um, that journalists are under extreme pressure these days to turn out news very, very quickly. Yeah. So therefore, there isn't always the time to check facts, to check what we're writing is accurate. Now, the public's only view, if they like, of things, especially like medical science, is what they read, maybe in the Daily Mail, um, that isn't always accurate and true. How dangerous is that 
um, for the reputation of, of scientists and, and journalists who aren't reporting proper stories to the public because they are sensationalised. Uh, I, I think that I, when it comes to medical science in particular, I, I get quite worried about that because that ends up on social media as well, sort of thing. You know, if you if you drink this, you will be cured of cancer. And you think, uh, no, look at the science of it. They were saying that if, if you upped your intake of water, uh, you could probably alleviate certain symptoms, but they're not saying it's a cure. So I, I am worried about that. I do get concerned about that because um, I think in this modern age, I mean, you say that they haven't got time to check. Well, this modern age, just go in Google or whatever search engine you'd like to use, you know, um, and you should be able to find enough to verify or not what the story is telling you. Um, I mean, sometimes things are fast moving, as you say, sort of things, discovery of an asteroid heading towards the Earth, sort of thing. You know, nowadays, news is instant, isn't it? And that is a problem. And that's why I would rather see properly trained journalists in science who've got a science background, actually, you know, so at least then they've got the scientific method and they think, I'm not, this really isn't a story. But as you say, I think really there's always the pressure to create a story and, you know, to, to get people to read either online or actually in the print itself. And, uh, and that, I think, will just continue. Uh, we've just got to hope that uh, people will you know, then do more research themselves. Because nowadays, you, you don't just rely on what you read in a, a newspaper or online. You tend to search. You think, if you're interested in it, you think to yourself, oh, well, I'll Google that and I'll go in and find out more. And then, usually, when you find out more, you start to find, oh, hang on, actually, that's not quite what they said. Yeah, this is the scientific report. Asteroid will just miss the Earth. This is the sensation. Asteroid will hit the Earth. And then you realise there's a big gulf between the two as such. So you can go online nowadays, I think, and pick out the information. And, uh, but, it, but it is getting harder, I think, because it's so instant, isn't it, nowadays? News is instant nowadays. So uh, as soon as it happens, it's reported, isn't it? Uh, you know. I can remember Chevrolet, the uh, meteor, it was it February, once it's all coming down, yeah. and some of the first reports was that it was a Russian missile that had gone wrong. Yeah. You know, so they're reporting a Russian missile goes haywire over Russia, and then it turned out as a blooming great big asteroid. And did you see it the other day? They just pulled the lump out the uh, lake. They've just found mm. a great big chunk of, oh dear, that'll be worth a fortune. Because mm. there are meteorite hunters around the world who actually will hunt meteors, and, then will, and you can spend probably a few hundred dollars on a chunk that big, depending on the time. Uh, so it's a bit uh, authenticity, uh, Yes, yes, yes. But then, you know, I could type out a, c a certificate on my computer and print it and make it look really fancy, mm -hmm. wouldn't I? So uh, I am a little bit worried about that. But I know, I know what you're getting at. I, I think instant journalism nowadays is something that we're going to have to cope with. But I think people do tend to be more intrigued and they will search at the story more if they're really interested in it. And uh, sometimes they'll actually come up with, oh, yeah, they did blow that up out of proportion, you know, and the truth is slightly different. Do you think, just to follow that up then, do you then think scientists are quite hesitant to tell journalists about stuff because they are worried that their research is going to be sensationalised rather than be what it is in, in a journal which tells us more information? I, I, I think it's a catch-22 because I think... Um, a lot of scientists are often reliant on being funded. And so therefore, um, if they get their research, even if it's misrepresented into the news, it's in the news, it's in the public domain, and it's visible. You know, and I think that's a danger because then you're not doing it for the research itself. <coughs> you know, you're doing it so that you can secure your funding for the future. So uh, I, I worry about that because, uh, you know, that's the wrong, to me, that's the wrong way to doing it, but then I'm not making a living quite like that. So, uh, you know, so I, I, that, 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 that's uh, one way to look at it, I think. For a long time, there was a split between the humanities and the sciences, so, so artificial split, some might say. And mm. then you look at the photographs you mentioned about the astrospace.co.uk, you look at, you say, the images that's around. Do you think we're coming around to a notion of people who actually say you can do stuff in humanities and appreciate the beauty of science as well? Are we getting back to that? I, I, I've always believed that, you know, there's, there's raw beauty in science, you know. I mean, what, you can't tell me you can't look at a Hubble picture of a fantastic glowing nebula and just be awestruck with it. You don't have to know the science behind it to appreciate the sheer beauty of it. Um, I just wish that in astronomy that we, we, and we are getting there, it is slow, but we are getting there, we're getting the technology now whereby you can actually live look at these objects and start to see them as the pictures show. 
you know, it's taken a long time because obviously the development of cameras, CCDs and whatnot, you know, um, there's the ones called the Malin cams, which are the closest, very expensive, but they now give you a live view of deep sky objects. And uh, so, you know, I, I don't see why anybody, you don't have to be a scientist to appreciate the beauty of a nebula or a galaxy interacting with another sort of thing, like a, a stately ballet. You know, I think that's amazing. Yourself. And in terms of the cost effectiveness, I think it was Carl Sagan who said the total cost of all of the uh, Apollo Voyager trips was about two, two cents per, per head of per, population. Per head of population, yeah. yeah. Um, are, we li are we getting it back? Are we, are, do you think, I mean, obviously George Bush, probably one of the few semi-sensible things he actually said was he was projecting ahead to manned Mars missions and so on. Is it important for what's, what, what is intrinsically human to actually have that urge to explore the sort of things that brought us Columbus and Galileo and all of those sort of folk from that? Yeah. I, th I think to explore is to be human. That, it's our nature. The fact that you're even here is a sense of curiosity, wanting to know what I was going to tell you about. That's curiosity. We are humans. We are naturally curious. Uh, we look out onto the universe in the same ways we look. We, you know, when you think back to the cavemen, cave women as well. That's what we're <laughs> but you think back to their sort of thing. You know, how do we explore the world? It's because they saw the hill and thought, who? Okay, they probably didn't think quite like that. But they went and walked up, they climbed to the top of the hill, and then they saw there was a valley. And then they saw, perhaps in the distance, there was a range of mountains. And they thought, what's that? And then they wanted to go and explore and find out what was over the next ridge. And that's the same with astronomy. We're always looking out. We have an, this amazing ability. I mean, the ancients, you know, astronomy is the oldest science. I know we were talking before that it actually started off as astrology. You know, astrology and astronomy were the same thing because they didn't know, they didn't have the scientific method at that time. They didn't ask, what was that object? They asked, how does that affect me? Because they thought it did. You know. But, you know, our astronomy, looking up at the night sky is the oldest thing we've ever done. You know, I mean, ever since we were able to look up, we looked up and thought, what's that? You know, what's beyond the next hill? What's beyond that ocean that we can see? We have this thing inside us that makes us want to explore. And I can identify really truthfully with that for the simple reason that when I was a little boy, I, I grew up at Winsby, which is between Spilsby and Horncastle, exactly halfway between. And this is before the nature reserve got established there. It was just wild, it was owned by a farmer. It was at the back of our house. So there's this wonderful interconnecting series of valleys. And I just explored, I rambled that. So it's sort of like at seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, even up to 15, actually. I rambled the whole reserve. I knew the rabbit tracks and all that because I was just fascinated by exploration. But at the same time, there were actually several on the sides of the hills. There were sandbanks. No. One was Mars. The other one over the other hill was Jupiter. There was Saturn. I never did get to Uranus, we won't go there, no, but the, the thing was, in my mind, it was the same as exploring and I set myself targets, right, I'm going to wander over and explore that sandbag, that was Mars, so I imagined landing on Mars, then I went over the hill and I found the one that I decided was Jupiter, I eventually made it to Saturn, I did have my target set for Uranus and Neptune, which were actually the other side of the main road, about two miles away. And they were gas giants, of course, Paul, so it's it sunk into the whole thing. Yes, 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 we won't go there, but, uh, but in my mind, I was exploring, I was fascinated with this idea of exploration. And uh, I sometimes wonder whether I would have made an explorer. I think I would have done. You know? I, I, but it comes back to all of us. We all, I think, have something inside us that just says... And you can't tell me that if you're walking on a clear night and suddenly a meteor shot, you can't tell me you didn't look up and go, oh, wow. I guarantee everybody in this room would go, oh, wow. What was that? Or would you run for the hills saying they're landing? Well, yes. If, 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 if uh, well, I will say if there's green and red flashing lights, it's an aeroplane. You know, that is pretty much every time. <laughs> I've never seen, I, I, I anticipate your question, okay. I have never, ever seen something I couldn't identify. Now, what you thought, for somebody who's a nutter, I mean, I mean an astronomer, <laughs> who's outside, I mean, I will, I mean, obviously with the reviews, what we have to do is we take the nights when we can get them, because you know what the UK weather's like. So I'll be out for, as soon as it gets dark, and I will be out all the way through the night testing the equipment, you know, doing it through various things, photographing with it if it's a photographic equipment. I haven't seen anything I couldn't explain. I've had a few strange situations. I had three satellites coming over in a triangle. Well, three do make the triangle, don't it? But came over, there was one in the front and two behind, and that was weird. It was the first time I ever saw it coming over, sort of like that. 
I had to go down to Hurstman, so to a big convention, and I got chatting to, uh, I missed one of the lectures, I got there too late, and um, they had a massive, they had a huge camera there. And I'm, I, when I say camera, I'm talking about a lens that wide. It was just to photograph up. It's stationary, but it just photographed up. But they used it for satellite tracking. They photographed the satellites coming over. And uh, I just happened to say, you know, about three weeks ago, I had a really weird experience. And I explained what it is. It's like US military satellite. Prime satellite deploying two, two sub-satellites. And I had that um, about three years ago. I was watching, and one was coming over, and then I realised there was a fainter one behind it. And then I, no, ahead of it. And then I watched it, and a tiny one separated from the main one and drifted behind. And what it was doing, it was, it was slowing down, and then it took up formation. And I watched it, and again, it turned out to be a US military satellite deploying two sub satellites. So that was the weird, because the first thing goes there, do, 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 do. <laughs> and you think, this is it, sort of thing, you know, get ready, you know. Uh, um, but can well, you, too far into it. I'll be all right for time, because I'll yes, tell you yes, one yes. more thing. Um, but uh, I, I had a, an instance, can you remember Anton Deck a few years ago did that film whereby the alien autopsy? Yeah, some, yeah, some of you remember that. And uh, it's supposed to be based on the idea that Roswell, this is supposed to be a UFO crash site, which turns out it was a balloon, and uh, you can ask me afterwards why we know it was a balloon. Um, it was a military balloon. But the point was, uh, th this alien autopsy was on this particular night, and it was a clear night. And I got this little observing site just down the road, about two miles away. And, uh, you know, they, they were doing this, and I just sat there and I thought, well, it's a load of rubbish. You know, they, it, there is absolutely no way. They're obviously, you know, dummies, and it's all been faked. So uh, and I thought, well, you know, I'm going to observe my site. I said to Lorraine, right, I'll be out. I'm, I may not be home till four or five o'clock in the morning, sort of thing. So it's going to be a long stretch. But, you know, this is before I was reviewing it, by the way. This is just for sheer fun. So I went out to me observing site. I'm in the middle of nowhere, Lincolnshire Walls. And I stood then, the thought came to my mind, you know, I could be kidnapped now and nobody would know. <laughs> So I stood in the middle of nowhere and put my hands out and I went, right, here I am, come and take me then. <laughs> no, not good enough. And, you know, but as somebody pointed out, did I check my watch? Because I don't know, I could have been. And I might have been programmed not to remember. Absolutely. So exactly. I have no idea. Yes, but it just struck me, I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm standing there shouting out, come and take me, sort of thing, you know. And they could have done. And Lorraine wouldn't have worried <laughs> until sort of like daybreak, probably, when she woke up and there's nobody in the bed. Sort of thing, you know. So, uh, you know, but I have not met any astronomers, any amateurs or professionals who have said, we've seen something strange. Usually, if they have, they've, it's been one of these Chinese lanterns. Oh, could, don't get me onto that one. No, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, looking ahead, of course, you're performing, I say performing, presenting uh, on behalf of Lincoln Inspired's uh, first anniversary at the collection yeah. in Dainsmith. That's on the 17th of November. Mm -hmm. We'll yeah. for that, which we'll sort through. We've got time possibly for one more question. If anybody's got anything they want to throw in, is that? Yes. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of things over these past few years through the telescope. What, do you, what is the most beautiful thing you've witnessed? Um, there are so many um, because they each have their own unique little appeal. But I suppose one of the things, and one of my earliest memories, was actually looking at Saturn and really seeing the rings. You know, it's just something to see a planet. All the other planets, they're just a globe, you know, or a half-phase globe. Yeah. But to see a planet with rings around it, you know, is just absolutely amazing. And it's one of the things I do try to do in my public star nights. In public star nights, literally, you come along. If it's clear, I'll show you the sky through a telescope. Um, if it's cloudy, I'll bore you to death with a talk. As such, you know, hopefully it won't bore you. But, you know, I, you know, I urge you, if you get a chance to look through a telescope at Saturn, it is, it's one of those wow moments. And I know that because a nine-year-old, it's always a nine-year-old, actually, isn't it? but as a nine-year-old came to my Gibraltar Point Star Night some years ago, and uh, he looked through the telescope at Saturn, and was very cheeky, he turned and said, oh, you've got a picture at the end of the telescope. So I said, have a little look, and he looked through it, and I banged the telescope, and of course the image went, and he said, oh, I believe you, mister, I believe you. And then he said the classic, Oh, it's wicked! Now I know I've won him over when they see that they either say cool or wicked. You know, sick is, is, is the know. vernacular these days. Is that, oh, sick. oh dear, so I, I don't sick. get worried if they say that's sick. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> to me that would be, sick. oh, well, I'm trying my best. <laughs> you know. But, uh, but that, is, that is something that's always stuck in my mind, seeing Saturn for the first time, and even now I can still look at Saturn and go, wow, you know, with the rings. But I've looked at galaxies that are. The furthest thing I've seen is um, there's a quasar called 3C273, two and a quarter billion light years away. It's just a dot. You look at it and you think, it's a dot. 
you know, but it's the knowledge. A lot of the time, it's the knowledge, knowing what you're looking at, which is amazing. Like a galaxy that's you know, 100 million light years away, or this dot, which I, I say, it's just a star. It looks like a star. They were classified as a star originally. And then they found out it's the incredibly luminous core of a galaxy 2.4 billion light years away. That is, you know. So that dot, to me, I had a, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck still look like, that's, that's 2.4 billion, that set off 2.4 billion years ago. So like I say, don't blink. It's got a long way for you to blink and miss it, but it can't. I'm reminded that Paul has kindly actually brought a whole collection of uh, wonderful booklets along, which are free. My Night Scenes 2013, I've got quite a few copies left over, so they're in the box. If anybody wants, they're, they're actually free to take over. And the latest edition, actually, for next year, it tells you what to look out for in the night sky. Now, 1% of the world's population has never seen, uh, uh, only 1% of the world's population has ever seen Mercury, the innermost planet. And yet, it's a naked eye planet. If you know when and where to look, that's the reason why I do night scenes. I say the 2013 editions, they're free if you want to take them. And at that moment on a, uh, a session which has brought us galactically across the, the universe <laughs> in all sorts of marvellous ways, can ask you to join me in thanking Paul Money. I was slightly worried when he introduced him. I had visions of it being a Graham Norton moment and he had a lever if he didn't like the answers and I would disappear into the back sort of thing, but I'm glad to say it didn't happen.